Coming up, I relive the Home Computer Club. I play some games. Jeff does something. I improve my basic games. And I end with a type-in. Let's get on then. You know that feeling. You're browsing through your favourite magazine and a ton of junk falls out. Usually adverts for various things. Pizza Hut. Sponsor a puppy. Buy an Amazon Alexa. Subscribe to a magazine and it goes on and on. But this happened back in the day too. The mid to late 80s to be precise. And the culprit was the Home Computer Club. They proclaimed bargains that were just too good to be true. Three games for just 49 pence each. Of course it wasn't that simple and you had to join the club to be able to get these bargains. But what else did you have to do? The Home Computer Club also provided their service to other micro-users, including Amiga owners, Atari, Amstrad and BBC owners. Once you had chosen your introductory game, or games, you sent off your order and they duly arrived. You then had to pay for them and also enter into an agreement that you would then buy at least one game four times a year, or six times a year, depending on the machine you had and when you joined. Here is the membership guide. It welcomes you to the club and tells you about the club magazine, Programme. This is sent to you every two months and is packed full of bargains. Now there is a catch. Every time you got the magazine, you had to take at least one item. If you didn't choose an item, you'd be sent what they called the main selection. This was a headline game that they had picked for each issue of the magazine, promising at least 25% off the retail price. They also promised more titles and books, with up to 50% off. In turn, you had to agree to choose one item per magazine and remain a member of the club for a minimum of one year. Let's have a little browse through the magazines then. Oh, they're not really magazines, they're more like pamphlets. Anyway, there's no date on them, only a season, and the earliest one I have is from winter, and based on the main selection, which is Firebird and Iridium double pack, I would presume 1986. Each issue has a number on the back. This one is 15S. Each game or book in the magazine gets a small write-up, usually with screenshots and often with quotes from various reviews. Flicking through this issue, we get the writer word processing package at a decent discount, even though it was released the year before. Not sure past your driving test would have been a big seller though. And the best selling titles page has some older titles included. Nothing really jumps out at you in this issue as being a quality game, utility or book. Heavy on the Magic is probably the best one here with a saving of just £3. And maybe Cauldron 2 would have caught the attention of many. Looking at the other magazines, the main selection is on the front. And this one includes Brian Clough's Football Fortunes. In the same issue are Treasure Hunt, Asterix, The Music Box, EastEnders, oh dear, and Bobby Baring, and many more. Marble Madness with a saving of £4. And in the same issue, The Filer, Trapdoor, Glider Rider and Fist 2. On this issue we have Armageddon Man as the main feature with a saving of £3. And other titles inside include Gauntlet and Gauntlet 2, Mini Office, Bomb Jack with Ghosts and Goblins, Paperboy and some old ocean titles. It's interesting to see the varied content of these magazines, although it seemed the original owner disliked Driller. One issue had a top 10 list inside with some really good quality titles listed. Now here we've got Barbarian 2 and here we see that the original game is included with this pack. Now I'm not sure if this is an exclusive to the Home Computer Club because they did have them later on and I can't find the game mentioned anywhere on the internet site so maybe they just threw the two games together rather than having an exclusive double pack. The same issue has Endura Racer for £7.45 that famous and well-known classic, Tank Attack. Right, okay. Uh, 
Got Gary Lineker's super skills. And Instant Recall. Not a game, a business filing system. It also has some good titles like Boogie Boy and Thunderblade. Now this issue promises Total Eclipse as its main selection, along with an exclusive game. It seems Incentive Software created an exclusive game, or level, for the club, but doesn't name it. It says it features more puzzles and a tougher pyramid. Now I can't find this anywhere on the internet either. In the same issue we get Times of Law, Superman, Salamander, and Batman the Cape Crusader, along with Blasteroids, the Munsters, and more. It seems later on, the club joined together the Amstrad, Commodore and Spectrum magazines into one. And inside, we get games that are cross-platform or just for individual systems. Here, for example, is G-Lock, with separate prices for each machine. They also offered a fun box, a random pick of three games for 19.99. No doubt, all the old rubbish they didn't sell the previous three or four years. Although they do show various games from previous issues. In this issue is HeroQuest, along with Hudson Hawk, a dedicated Spectrum page, an Amstrad page, and a Commodore 64 page, and the usual business stuff. In this issue, you get a free watch if you buy any two of the games listed, and the other games in this include Toyota Celica GT Rally, Stunrunner, and Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. I found it interesting to read through these, it's almost like flicking through your mother's shopping catalogue and pretending not to look at the underwear section. No, that, that really doesn't make sense, does it? Okay, anyway, the Home Computer Club had some good offers, but you had to stick with them for a year and buy one game with each magazine they sent. I suppose that wasn't bad if you didn't have many games or you'd just got a computer and were looking to get some, but I suppose it could be troublesome if you did have a lot of games and you'd end up having to buy a load of old dross or a book or a business programme. Still, it's nice to browse through these and see what was on offer. Dragon Spirit was a highly thought of arcade vertical shooter, released into the arcades by Namco in 1987. You were not a flying futuristic spaceship though, instead you were a dragon, on a mission to rescue a princess. It had some very nice visuals and effects, and very hard gameplay. You had two weapons, flames to take out flying enemies and bombs to take out ground based enemies. Destroying some enemies allowed power ups too, so pretty much everything is here for a shooter. The game was released on the Spectrum in 1989 by Damark, and it must have been a daunting task to try and convert this to the 8-bit machine. The result though is quite good, with a smooth scrolling landscape and good gameplay. There's no music during the actual levels though, which is a shame, but the gameplay elements are all there. You get flames and bombs, and the enemies remain true to the original. The game is slightly easier than the arcade, for me at least, but the enemies seem to appear quicker, in that on the first level, for example, the time taken to get to those snake things, or whatever they are, is less than the arcade. The backgrounds are detailed, but as can often happen in monochrome games, the enemy bullets can frequently get lost. The scrolling is smooth, and the sprites are well drawn, and do convey the arcade game very well. As much as I enjoyed playing this, I never got very far. At times it seemed like a bullet hell game, which I hate. With so much happening on screen, it was impossible to find a safe spot. At the end of the level there's a boss which you have to take care of, but I never made it that far. The rest of the footage here is me playing with an immunity poke, so I can see the other levels. The second level has a change of colour, as do subsequent levels, but all of them do adhere to the arcade version and represent each style very well. All the enemies are included, so are the boss battles. Yes, there are a few things missing, 
like the parallax moving cliffs in level 5, but that doesn't distract from the game at all. Another thing missing is the transition to undersea shooting on level 7, and this is lost on the Spectrum version, mainly because of the effects like bubbles, which are on the arcade and give you a feeling that you're underwater. Area 8 on the arcade is deep inside a tunnel, with only the visible area being spotlit. On the Spectrum, this appears to be in some kind of city, which is Area 9 of the arcade. I enjoyed this game though, despite it being very hard. and first got into it when playing on my Namcom Museum Mini Arcade Cab. A great game then, especially if you're a shoot 'em up fan and are very good at that type of game. Originally created for the Atari 2600 console in 1982, this well-received vertical shooter was ported to the Spectrum and other consoles and micros quickly. The Spectrum version was released by Activision in 1984. You control a jet plane on an endless raid behind enemy lines. You fly over a river shooting enemy ships, helicopters and jets, and all the time trying to avoid them and the riverbank itself. You also have limited fuel, which can be replenished by flying over the fuel dumps. The Spectrum version sticks to the 2600 one and maintains all of the elements. You can move left or right and accelerate or decelerate, and of course shoot. The river scrolls in character squares unlike the original which has smooth scrolling and all enemies move in the same fashion. This doesn't affect gameplay though and it's an enjoyable blast. When you accelerate, you have to keep the key held down, or the joystick pushed up, depending on what you're using. If you then release it, you automatically slow down. Pressing the down key or pulling back on the joystick will slow you down, which is useful to refuel. The original also works like this. As you move left and right, your plane banks, again like the original, although the small sprite often means you miss this animation. The enemies include ships, helicopters, balloons, and what I thought were birds, but turn out to be jets. There are also tanks and bridges that need to be shot. Sound is used well with some nice effects, and when at full speed, the game is quite challenging. As the levels increase, which you can select at the start if you want a harder game, things do get tougher, with more enemies, both static and moving, and tanks on the riverbank that fire at you, and also later on, helicopters start firing as well. It's a simple game, a pick up and play shooter that was designed for the early consoles, and as such, it does what it was designed to do and it does it well. It's an early game on the Spectrum too, and this shows with basic blocky graphics, but the gameplay holds up very well. A blast from the past then, and definitely worth a play. This is Shovel Adventure, released in 2022 by Pat Morita team. The game is a version of the original for the Amstrad CPC, and has a really nice intro sequence. The game is not free though, but for less than £2, you get a lot of game for the money. You play a legendary archaeologist, and have just found the entrance to a tomb. To be able to enter it, you first have to go into the large pyramid and find all of the gems in each chamber. And the game has 40 chambers, so plenty of gameplay there. You are equipped with a shovel, and you use this to dig up the small mounds, under which are the gems and other items, such as time freeze.
You can also dig holes in the ground to force chasing enemies to fall into them. You can then fill the holes in to kill them, or just leave them there for a while. And this is ideal for when things get really busy. You do have a time limit for each chamber though, so you can't afford to hang around. Some enemies, like the snakes, can't be dropped into holes, so a different approach is needed to get to the gems that they're guarding. The graphics are excellent, with great little Egyptian themed tunes playing throughout the game. This is a game produced to a very high standard, and is really playable. Simple controls, great presentation, and overall an excellent title. A few episodes ago, we looked at something that Dave Clark had done, putting backgrounds onto Spectrum games using Layer 2. If you look at Dave Clark's YouTube channel, you'll also see something cool that he did with pallet cycling. Something that looked a bit like this. When I saw that, I thought, I'd love to know how that works. So I set up to find out, and this is what I did. Rather than start with squares and diamonds, I thought I'd start simple. Just some vertical lines across the screen that I could get to move by cycling the pallet. I wrote some basic code, and this is it. So let's take a look at what it does. Line 10 just makes sure I save my basic code. Line 20 runs the spectrum at 28 kilohertz. Line 30 enables layer 2 and sets it visible. Line 40 says clear the pallet, reset it back to what it was. Line 50 sets the pallet to be 8 bit. Then I draw some lines. The first thing I did was draw the very top line of the layer 2 image to be one colour for each pixel. Layer 2 exists in banks 9, 10 and 11 in the spectrum next. I cycled round the first line, 256 values from 0 to 255, and poked in the same value as the X value at that pixel. Line 90 just iterates back round. Then I used the bank copy function to copy the first line down the rest of bank 9, that being the first third of the layer 2 screen. Then for the other two thirds, I just used bank copy for the entire bank, copying bank 9 to banks 10 and 11. Next we get into the interesting bit, defining a new palette. Find a bank to define your palette in, then you want your palette to be bigger than 255, so every palette is 255 values, one for every value a pixel can take in layer 2. Line 180 simply pokes those values into bank B, and line 190 routes around our all 512 values, making them zero. So every single palette value is black after you've done that. Then what I did is go back through the palette I just defined and every eight value I set to a different color, red, green, blue, and magenta. At this point, all that's left to do is cycle a palette. Line 270 defines a loop. We're gonna cycle through 255 different positions in the palette we've just defined. 280 sets the palette for layer two to be an offset defined by X in bank B. Effectively, what you're doing there is cost X will increase one every time, you're just moving the palette on one value. That's why we made the palette bigger than 255. 290 pauses, because if you don't do that, it runs too fast. 300 loops back to the next X, and then 310 just makes it run forever. And when you run that code, it looks something like this. Now I was really pleased with that, and I thought, what else can I do? There's a nice circle function in Spectrum Basic, and that works on layer two as well. Let's try it with circles. I modified the code that you've just seen to, instead of doing lines down the screen, do concentric circles centered on the center of the screen, out to the edge. However, when I ran that code, I got a strange effect, as you can see. Now, I'd watched Dave's YouTube channel, and I knew that there was a way around this. And then I realised, what you need to do is set the background colour of your image to be an odd value. 
And then, instead of jumping up one value every time you cycle the palette, if you jump up two and make sure that none of your colours are in odd values, which mine weren't from the definition you've just seen, then the background values that you have would never change to any other colour than black. So I did that and this is what I got. As you can see, the odd flashing of randoms, pixels, that kind of scatter of pixels that aren't written when you use the circle command, no longer flash. And now it's just left to your imagination. Feel free to replicate my code and play with it. It would be great to see some palette cycling on the next appear on YouTube sometime soon. A big thank you has to go to Dave Clark again. Thank you for the inspiration for this. Thank you for giving me something to think about and to show everyone on the Spectrum show. Until next time, happy gaming. When you typed in those early games and ran them, or even when you wrote your own, you were probably unable to get decent sound effects. Did that beeper really do your game justice? You could, if you looked hard enough, find small machine code routines in magazines that hopefully, if worked, would add a little extra sparkle to your games. However, there were a few commercial alternatives, and this one from DKtronics Sound Effects is one of them. This is not so much a library of sound effects, it's more a random sound effects generator. You first decide how many sound effects you want in your game. So, for example, you could have one for shooting, one for explosions, one for game over, etc. On the main screen, you can press any key to get a random sound effect, or press N for noise effects, or Z for zap effects. The sound effects seem to be randomly generated from a set number of criteria, and as you step through them one at a time, you'll find one that suits your needs. When you do, you can save it to memory. Once you have all the sound effects that you want, you can then save the block of code out to use in your own games. Once you load the code into your own games, you then just have to go through and replace all the beeps with the relevant randomised USR calls. Each of the sound effects are 50 bytes each. So the first one will be at 30,000, the next one will be at 30,050, etc. Once you've done all that, you can now see what your game looks and sounds like with these new sounds. Yes, there's certainly a notable difference there. The good thing about Sound Effects by DKtronics is that it's not a library, as mentioned before, and you can get many random sounds, and it doesn't sound like the same routine that everybody else used from a magazine. A nice little package then, and useful if you wrote a lot of basic material or even early commercial releases. A Day at the Races appeared in Home Computing Weekly in March 1984, and as the name suggests, it isn't your usual shooting or dodging game. The listing was split across three pages, covering about one and a half A4 sheets in total, and was easy to type in as the text was quite clear and easy to read, Always an advantage. When first ran, I found a few problems, mainly down to my typing rather than issues with the listing. So let's give it a try then. You start with 20 somethings, there's no pound or dollar sign, but it would be easier to add if you wanted to. As each race is about to begin, you are asked if you want to place a bet on any of the three horses that are shown along with their odds. You can pick one or pass. Picking one prompts for an amount you want to bet, and then the race begins.
the graphics are quite nice for a typing, using multiple user-definable graphics to build a horse. Sadly, there is no rider, but each horse gets a different colour and a different saddle colour, and these are all random. The horses race across the nicely drawn screen, using a random value to dictate how fast they go. The winner is shown, and if you pick the right one, you get the money. There are 10 races to get through, that is, if you don't lose all your money first. The best I've managed is to complete all 10 games, ending up with 100 units of money. Overall, this is a nice little game. It's a change from the usual stuff, and it's quite relaxing to play. The horse names are all in code, and are randomly picked by the game, so if you wanted, you could change them. Here's my version, with Spectrum-related names. Much more fun. Or how about this one with computer names? This is probably the first time it's been seen in over 30 years, and it will be available to download from my website shortly.